Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Adjustment meeting for February 6, 2020, which is now called to order. Um, we ask that you silence your cell phones. Um, and for anyone who is not the applicant and would like to speak on a matter, we ask that you fill out one of these white cards that's available outside and let us know your name and address. Uh, and that you try to limit your comments to five minutes. Uh, first item on the agenda is to receive the minutes from the January 16th, 2020 meeting. Have a vote or any changes? Move approval. Second. Motion and a second to approve the minutes from the January 16th, 2020 meeting. Cast your votes, please. And it looks like we need to. And they're approved. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is continuance requests or withdrawals. Do we have any? We have item number two, case number 14704, 05, and 06 to continue to March the 5th. Item number five, case number 14711 to March the 5th. Item number eight, case number 14663 to March 19th. And item number seven, case number 14645 has been withdrawn. Is anyone here to speak on those matters? Okay. Um, with regard to item number eight and that continuance request, um, this is one that's been continued several times, and I assume the applicant's not present. Uh, uh, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. I may be the applicant. So the situation is my client believes that he will be able to work it out administratively with staff. In the event that he can't, then we'll be here presenting uh, before the board. So um, it, it's a bit of a mess, but he's hopeful that he can go fix this without the need for a variance. Um, Unfortunately, that's kind of all the information I've got at this point. He wants to do that task on his own. My only question, I appreciate you um, providing some, some context. My only question would be, is one month enough time? To sure. Get that, just so we don't have to keep bringing it up on the docket and voting for continuance. Um, I don't know, like I said, because he wants to, to work with staff um, on his own. I, I really don't know how far along he is in that process. Has he met with you, JJ? Yes, he's met with uh, zoning, and he's also met with building and inspections. And he's, there are several options, um, and he's working towards that and going to bring us, some, hopefully, some different options for the building that would meet code. If I may, uh, Mr. Chair, ask a, a question. Do you, I mean, do you believe that there, it looks like there is a path to some administrative solution? There, there is. Okay. I think he can get there. So, I mean, and if the board wants to move it a little further just to avoid it coming on another docket, I'll just tell them that you guys strong-armed me and had no choice. Um, what, do we have the calendar so we can see what the April? Let's look at meeting, a meeting date on April 2nd. Um, I'd prefer to move it to that and then if uh, the applicant wants a continuance from that date, he would need to establish some pretty good cause or else we're just going to vote on it. Um, and so I can't make a motion, but that's what I would suggest to the board. I move that we continue case number 14663 to the April 2nd docket. Thank you. And then the uh, other continuous requests for items number two and five, do we want to grant those or uh, move to approve those as requested? Move to approve, approve uh, items two and five of the continuances. Second. Okay, for the first motion on item number eight, cast your votes, please. And that's approved. And for the second motion, items number, items number two and five, cast your votes, please. And that's approved. 
Seeing nothing on the consent docket, we'll move to items requiring a separate vote. Okay, we have item number one, case number 14695 for a variance to the required number of parking spaces in the C3 Community Commercial District located in the 700 block of West Britain Road. Is it my turn to talk? Yes, sir. This is my first rodeo here. Um, we're developing uh, on the west side of this block uh, Owl Court, which used to be an old Route 66 uh, motor oh, court. Sorry to stop you, sir. Could we just get your name and address for the record? Oh, sorry. Mark Weinmeister, 1913 Chaparral Lane, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73013. Okay. Thank you. Can I start? Yes. Okay. Um, so, as I was saying, we are redeveloping this motor court, and in that picture you can barely see to the east of subject, we still have the hut, which is right on the northwest corner of that plot, and then we had to demolish the three buildings immediately to the east because they were falling apart. We bought this building out of um, abandonment and uh, derelict, and got it out of abandonment and derelict, and we're redeveloping the old motor court on the south side, and we uh, have in our plans enough parking to comply with the current parking restrictions. But if we redevelop anything else, we wouldn't have enough parking to comply with on-site parking requirements, as is the case with most of old downtown Britain. So the idea, we think of eventually this will be designated a, a district which will preserve the current dimensions and, and parking requirements that were back in 1950, 1930 when it was developed. But right now, we're encumbered with what I call Walmart and uh, Walgreens parking requirements. So if we go to redevelop, we have to build large parking fields, which would change the whole character of downtown. So we're asking to be released until they come up with the new um, codes, which they're going to come up with, from on-site parking requirements. And that's just for these, this one block here, which is contiguous. We were told that having contiguous uh, plots, it strengthens our case. So all of these guys got together and signed their deeds and turned them in. So that's where we are with it. There's been a, a protest, at least one protest. Did you want to speak to the, or have you reviewed the protest letter? I have indeed. Okay. Did you want to speak to the concerns of uh, yeah. Variety Care? Well, first of all, I want to say Variety Care is a great neighbor. They have a great product. They have gone in with a suburban style day hospital model, and they need a lot of parking for their model. They, you know, tore down a house off to the east, and they have, as I said in my response to their, um, to their objection, they have added a whole lot of parking for their needs. It's across a, four, a busy four-lane highway or four-lane street, and our intent is not to use their parking, but to have our parking and, and have our development in keeping with the old Britain town. Theirs isn't in keeping with the old Britain, so that's where the conflict occurs. I will point out that the city <coughs> Um, increased the size of Britain Road from two lanes to four lanes and got rid of a lot of the angled parking, which uh, we would support and also would, is supported in the SPUD 923 that um, Variety Care put together. Uh, also, for some incomprehensible reason, they have decided that Classen is an artery. It gets 2,000 cars a day. And about a third of those are going the wrong way because it's not properly marked. It's a very non-busy street. It's four lane each way, or two lane each way. And the city has not, um, has said that we couldn't do parallel parking there because it's an artery. So there is the capability for more on-street parking if we could just get it back. In addition, there's the median in the middle, which is 116 feet wide and a mile long, which is now being mowed. So if, you know, I don't know how that private-public partnership would work. It's also at the end of a, I'm rambling, I know, at the end of a, um, a bike trail and would be great for a trailhead. So eventually there could be more parking here. And eventually we're going to have a new city code that will accommodate these older districts. So 
So that's that's my case. Weak or strong? I uh, it, it certainly tips in favor of the application when you talk about kind of a temporary need, but I'm hesitant to put into kind of time limitation on this for since you are developing this, I think that might interrupt some things as far as your business plan. I don't know if funding is going to object if you have a three-year variance or something like that. So I'm hesitant to do a temporary time limit on it for that for that right. reason. We're not asking for a temporary one right. either. So. Right. Uh, you mentioned until the new code, which you think will address these. but um, So I just wanted to get that out there. But the other thing, and, and the most troubling thing to me, is I don't know exactly what we're granting. Um, I, I would like... Personally, I'm only one mem member of the board, but I would like to know how much parking, based on this combined area that you have, how much parking you currently are allowed, and what, how many spaces you're trying to get a variance for. Um, and right now, I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't either. And I, on, on, in our case at Owl Court, we have enough parking to comply with our current development. And so the need for the variance would be for some of these other parcels that have been combined? What's well, that? if we decide to do any more development, we'll have to figure out whether we're going to be treated like other older districts and not and be you know, in downtown and, you know, um, plaza and be released from on-site parking or whether we'll have to comply and thus reduce the walkability and the density of the, of the development. So is the variance to not have any on-site parking at all? Is that? Well, yes. OK. Um, yeah, that, that was my primary concern is what exactly are we granting? Um, are we granting a 20% you know, variance to the parking requirement or 100% variance to the parking requirement? You know, we, I, I wasn't sure based on the application. Um, if you're saying it's a 100% variance, so you, well, you don't have any. I'm, you can probably tell. I'm not an expert at this. Uh, so I wanted to be treated like the plaza and other older areas that have greater density and, more walk and are more walkable. And so I thought that there was a move in Oklahoma City that was understood to create that kind of an area. So that's what I'm applying for. I apologize for my ignorance. No, it's fine. I, it's well earned, though. So, some folks retain people to help. Some people do it on their own, and we treat everyone the same. So that, yeah. that doesn't bother me at all. I just need to get comfortable about exactly what we'd be granting. Um, and right now, I'm not comfortable with that. And if you're saying that you'd like a variance so that there is no parking requirement, I don't know that I'm on board with that right now. These are two of my partners. OK. Um, you're an architecture student. Well, and Go ahead. Yeah, so I, um, I have training. So I've Can you uh, get your, your 12, 18 Northwest 21st, Tyler Holmes. Okay. Um, so part of the issue with what we have is we can permit the uses we have currently. Um, the hut, he mentioned, it's, it's around 250, it's around 300 square feet. And currently that allows us to do office there. We have a 2,000 square foot building in the back, which it's the motel. It's kind of like a, it's like a U shape. And so with this, the thought is, is we've done as minimal um, uses as possible, which is primarily office and a little bit of retail. The issue we would have is, say, if we ever landed a restaurant with the building we have as is, we wouldn't be able to park it. So if we change the use, the occupants go up, and therefore we can't be granted that. Kind of the thing that he hinted at is a similarity is Britain districts, it's, a, it's an old downtown, or the Britain Britain used to be a city, and this was their main street. It was annexed into Oklahoma City in 1950, and so services changed. They couldn't afford it, and so basically this turned into just another area. Most of the buildings in the area, with, when you have buildings that are built the way they are in an urban context, the thing is, is you almost have to purchase a parking lot with it in order to park the buildings in place because, or you have to keep with the use that they have, but if you try and change the use, it's when the issue happens. So with this, going from a a gas station, motel, to office, anything. We have to keep our uses as low as possible. But as this area changes, if we build on, if we want to use this and say one restaurant wants to take the back, we don't want to run into an issue where we get rid of some of the integrity of the lot. Um, 
And we would compare this area to Plaza, Paseo, Stockyards, um, Uptown. Parking requirements have been waived in these areas. Downtown's one of the biggest examples. We think that this area is ripe for that. And we think that, you know, just uh, waiving that allows us more flexibility with, um, with prospective tenants. And so. Which is great. And those are all overlay districts. So it kind of sounds like that's what you're needing. This it, area. it would be ideal, but that is a whole other process. And so for this, we have essentially have overlaid um, all the uh, properties included in this. So it's using this to overlay it, but, um, you know, like he had mentioned, if the future code comes in and wants to do something bigger, it can change that way. But in order to make this area urban, parking is your biggest um, issue. and. Since parking is not an issue in the area, you know, um, I, we don't see any issues. The biggest issue is actually the need for too much parking. So, well, that's not kind of an issue it? right now. But if it develops the way that you want it to develop, you might end up with a plaza situation. Not to knock on the plaza, but there's some parking issues in the plaza. So uh, I live in Gatewood, um, and I'm I'm president of my neighborhood organization. Uh, we deal constantly with issues with um, the plaza having parking issues. My opinion on it, everyone may not agree, to say Plaza has a parking issue, I mean, it's, it's not completely true. Plaza is a solution, and it works really, really, really well. When it comes to um, leasing and rent rates, it's among one of the highest districts in the city. So to say if numbers follow that, like, it, it works, and um, it promotes walkability and, and provides equity for other forms of transit. So, you know, um, it, it kind of is an issue, but it's also, it's forcing the city to say, how else can people get to this area? Because people want density, and with density comes issues. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but. Yeah, I, I think, um, to Mr. Privet's point, I mean, one of the causes for hesitation here is are we effectively creating an overlay district? Um, or at least with regard to parking, are we effectively doing that? And do we want to do that? Um, I, before I speak, did you want to speak, sir? Yeah, like to speak. Okay. My name is Brad Rice, 1109 River Chase Drive in Edmond, Oklahoma. I'm also part owner um, of this particular property. I want to step back from our development, though, and look at the entire dotted line scenario and things to the west. To the west is a more dense area. There's Family Dollar. There's a lot of new um, zero lot line properties a block and a half to the west that literally have no parking lots. They rely on street parking in front of their buildings and there are marked spaces. There's still a lot of confusion when you drive down Britain Road. Are you driving down four lanes of road or are you driving down two lanes of road? The, the parking spots are older except in front of one uh, new THC location where they've painted those green. Not to throw them under the bus, but it looks really good um, from the parking standpoint. My point being is if there's a car parked there, it's a two-lane street, and they're parked in what looks to be a parking spot. If they're not, it's a four-lane street. So even as a scenario that Mark mentioned, if the spud across the street, the Variety Care did have angle parking as part of the spud, is that correct? They would support it. They would support it. There's probably 120 parking spots by making that full block uh, north of the dotted line, two-lane road with, with parking slots for, uh, for that. Uh, we've met with City Council before throughout the idea with this being an artery on Class and Road, that that meeting is so wide the city's paying for, for um, lawn, lawn mowing there. There's a tree there. Uh, it can make a good little park. Uh, the trailhead uh, could be there as well. There's actually what was a plaque. The bronze plaque's been stolen, so there was a monument to the town of Britain at some point that hasn't been kept up by by someone. I don't know who, who put it there. But we've gone with to the city on a lot of different avenues to say, hey, here are some solutions that we can bring to the table. I think staff is here, and in the staff report, they've even said that there's not a negative impact to the environment with this with this um, particular um, application. But I also just want to point out to the west, there's a lot of parking in front of zero lot line buildings. The, the theater's there, um, to, uh, zero tolerance coffee's there, and a lot of the other buildings that have had tenants in it for a long time, they're parking at street parking. 
And so that's part of the reason we came forth to say, look, we're being handcuffed with this as a development of mom and pops on the south side of the street. And back to your point about variety care with their objection, for me, not looking at it as a developer, that is their parking. They can enforce people being towed. So it's their parking. If I park there, I would expect to be towed, and I, I shouldn't get mad about it. So from that aspect, I, I don't see their argument from that aspect um, as being a true objection as to utilizing their space. Like Mark said, we have no intention, nor do anyone on the south side of the street intend to do that. If they do, they should be towed. Yeah, I think from their perspective, they would say that's just a, a burden that we would now have to go and enforce and call the tow truck, hire a security guy, whatever they're going to do. But it's just a burden that we should consider. I agree, but everyone else that has a private parking there can do that as well. So, yeah. okay. So I would just say that I share our, our chairman's concern in that there's not really a specific, you're, you're not asking for a specific number. Um, and so we don't know. I mean, I just had some questions jotted down as far as the number of spaces that are currently available. Um, how many are you anticipating needing? That sort of thing. Um, but in addition, am I understanding you correctly that for what you have going on now in the project, you have parking is sufficient? You're, you're just anticipating a need in the future if it c continues to develop into something like Paseo or... It would change our potential use. Our original vision for our particular property was to have a courtyard that would embrace community. So if we have parking there, we won't be able to do that. We won't be able to have a stage. We have an area that we've actually wired behind the hut that we can have a food truck come in. No one's going to want to have a food truck and just come hang out with their family on an asphalt parking lot when it's 104 degrees in Oklahoma. So it could definitely change what we decide to do. We don't have tenants in the back building yet. We're still finishing that up. We have a lease with the front building, which will be a small coffee shop, kind of the same scenario. Um, even though it's 280 square feet, the challenge is how will he grow his business if we don't develop that community aspect? Because to the right of us is a daycare, to the right of them is a, is a feed, store. feed store. Yeah, so, so we're trying to bring the community to the east because we have a little bit of property that's not zero lot line, and we could change our use a little bit by having parking that we can utilize from the street or, or elsewhere from this variance. I think you'll see this area become a district similar to what the plaza is and stockyards and those that don't have any parking requirements, but it's, that's a long, lengthy process to get there. I think this really is more of a kind of a stopgap uh, because they're, they're developing now where uh, a lot of the rest of the town of, of, of Britain is not. So. Kind of takes care of their needs, and then in the meantime, the city is going to work towards uh, finding a solution for the rest of of the Britain downtown. I, I think just for me, if if I had something in front of me I could look at that you know has parking spaces, you know, shown here, this is what we got. This is what we're wanting to you know either do away with or you know move around or you know, whatever. Just some idea of what y'all want to do. I think I can support what y'all want to do. It, Sounds like it makes sense. I just don't, I can't wrap my head around what exactly that is. But I guess that's that's kind of where I am. I'm, I think you're almost there. Um, you've got some compelling arguments. You've got some positive comments from the staff report talking about, um, or some favorable considerations, um, applying modern parking requirements to historical commercial areas such as this can hinder development, et cetera, comments like that. I think you're almost there. I just think for me personally, I would like to know exactly how many parking spaces you're required to have by the code. Um, what's, why it's not possible that you can't have some on-site parking and that you've exhausted all your alternatives, for example, bike racks that would reduce your overall parking requirement, things like that. All of those hit to a, a criteria that we have to meet by state statute, which is the variance if granted would be the minimum necessary to alleviate the unnecessary hardship. So I think you're probably there on, hard, on hardship, but I don't think you're there on this being the minimum necessary. So, so on the plan, we, um, we have, we, we kind of have a, we're, we're figuring out where to locate the trash cans. And so with that, there's a potential to maybe lose one to two spots, depending on code, and it depends on use as well. Um, so we have at least 10 parking spots, um, I believe, 10 to 11, but also um, in it we've included six bike racks because with the bike racks you can decrease um, the number of parking by 25%. So we've stretched as far as we can on that. 
And so we have, um, and also it's, it's drawn and, and pulled our uses down to do very low occupant uses. So if we want a restaurant to come to our property and we were to come to this meeting and say, hey, we have a, a restaurant, it's been permitted, we're good, it's like we can't come to this meeting prepared with that because they won't approve our permit. So when we are leasing, the issue we come up with is we can't propose a restaurant because our parking count would nearly double. So therefore, we, we would have to get rid of our courtyard, which is what Brad hit into. So what this could do and change for the future of our property, it just would change how it activates the area. So um, it's kind of making that choice of do you want more people there or less people? So. Excuse me. It was granted how much property do you own and how many more additional parking spaces can you put on that lot? Because I've seen the area and it doesn't look that large. And you're still saying that we may put a restaurant there. Normally, most restaurants can park more than 10 cars. So if you're already at capacity with 10, how many do you foresee adding? Say if we had a vision to make this like a blue garden, um, we would make the courtyard occupiable. Therefore, you could go to a stand to buy like food from a food truck. You could buy a beverage, and it would be enclosed within a fence. If that were the case, our occupants would go out the roof, and we, I mean, 40, 50 spots. That's a lot. Exactly. Or you don't Building. have 10. It, it, and it would, it, would, it would ruin the idea. And the thing is, is we are depending on um, the surface parking provided to the West to help out with this and possibility of maybe shared parking agreements. But it's hard to negotiate any of that when we can't bring any of that to the table. So it's just this thing where we, we, we believe that we can do it. And right now, this is regulating our ability to um, even envision that. So it's, it's um, yeah, that's. If we wanted to put this off a couple of weeks, we can come up with the parking calcs on what they have now and, and uh, the uses they have now. And I get that that might change back. with different developments, but just what, kind of this snapshot of time right now, what are we working with? That would help. Uh, at least me get to where you guys are trying to go. Uh, board members, any questions or comments? And unless you'd like us to, to take a vote on it today, um, I think the board is looking at a continuance. Um, I think the vote would be no today, so I think we ought to work together with you, and um, <laughs> just as we've been doing with the city. So we do appreciate you thinking yeah. through. If you have suggestions, we'd love to have some guidance back because. Um, the three of us have been involved with the Britain district uh, as a business district that was grassroots, started about two years ago. Um, so we're all trying to come along as, as small tenants and small owners and people that have been there for a long time to make this a cool area. Right now there's some lower income houses, there's some houses that could be brought up, but just to the east, if you think of Broadway Extension, you have Oklahoma Fidelity, you have Chaparral, you have Delisi going in and Flicks. There's a lot of things happening with employ employers to the east and nowhere to go. So that's kind of where our thoughts are as well. We're trying to be creative and say what will get people to Britain, as are some other investors just to the west of us. So I, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to, to further clarify this, because I think the city, as well as us, need to get our heads around what we think Britain's going to be. And we don't want Britain to die because of an arbitrary parking requirement. So, you know, I'd be glad to work with you all on this for the good of the city and us as well. So, thank are, you. Are you wanting to develop that whole block? I mean, no, those are other people who don't have really designs on development at the moment. You're just want, trying to get the variance for them also? Right, but for us, it's very pertinent. Um, and, you know, the point is our neighbors support the same idea. So it's not that, except for our uh, variety care, who's already got their parking all figured out. You know, there's our, no way, like an SPUD or something, they could go and, you know. It's getting close to that. Yeah, and that's what it smells like to me. Yeah. But uh, it gets you to the same place, really. Yeah. And they could roll be this, easier to get there on those boards than it would here, just my opinion. I think. I mean, I, I it, still it, have. It could, it could actually get a. If, you could see the vision we have, like, this actually could get approved today. And it, it would, we have everything 
we need we, we could work within city code on that to, to figure out anything forward but um, yeah it's I mean that I, I've, I've designed this in as many ways as possible to keep some of the integrity of the lot and it is it's a challenge to have a building that's on the south property edge and then a building on the north west edge and to find a way to park it to not make it feel like a s strip mall we really want to try and make this feel as fluid as possible and as urban as possible and it's this is like in our opinion the best way to get there so quick continuance question. is fine but it's quick question um if you were to add additional parking would you have entrance and exit from um, Classen as well, or just Britton Road? If we end up exiting from Classen, um, what you do is you actually separate the Al Court building, which is the small historic um, building, from the motel in the back, and it doesn't it doesn't create connectivity, and it actually separates them through a parking, basically through a drive lane. So, like, in order to throw a drive lane through the center of the property. You begin to separate um, the you buildings. Wouldn't a, you wouldn't have a courtyard concept anymore. Right. I think what you're trying so to say. go to a strip mall and there's an out parcel and then there's the main building. There it is. So that wouldn't create any um, traffic jams in that area because that's a small area. It'd just be. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We do have curb cuts on Classen and on Britain already, so there wouldn't be a request for a curb cut. It's just. It's going to create an issue, and then if people are trying to come in off a of class, and again, that side of the street is one way. Like Mark said, I, I can't count how many times I've had police cars driving the wrong way because they turn on the east side portion and drive down, and it's not just one block. They'll drive until they go over the hill for half a mile. So the concern is street traffic at that point, and when this does become busier with a bike trail, which it's already designated as, if that, our vision would be to have parking on the center median as a trailhead, um, previous city councilor didn't understand that concept. So we kind of let it lie for a while. And, um, and it's still a ways from that to be a really nice trail for a bike trail. But as these restaurants come in, it will be a destination. And I don't see, when Tyler said restaurant, we don't see ourselves having a garage or some larger restaurant. It's these smaller boutique food guys because our, our size is four or 500 square feet per micro suite. So we're not talking restaurant for ourselves at this point you see what I'm saying yeah, yeah and I don't have anyone else signed up to speak ma'am did you have anything you wanted to add or oh, I'm Susan Atkinson I'm city staff and I represent the commercial district sorry if you can get you by the by the microphone okay yes. thank you Susan Atkinson, I'm city staff, and I work with the Commercial District Revitalization Program. I just wanted to say that the district, Britain District, is one of our districts. Uh, I believe that was included in your staff memo, and I was just here to answer any questions that might arise about the district impact. And I will just add as an observation, um, this request originally came with the idea of a parking overlay district because that's something we've done in other historic commercial districts in the city. It also happens to intersect us at a time when the city is anticipating a very um, significant change in our development codes. So it's kind of a perfect storm and you know these applicants were looking for a remedy that would allow them, as they've described, to not be burdened by parking requirements that were designed for much larger parcels. Um, and so we're just sort of looking for a way to thread that needle. Yeah, and I agree. I, um, I understand why you came and took the variance route. I understand that. It's, it's quicker than going before planning commission. Um, and if it gets you where you want to go. But this could be a blessing in disguise, um, getting a short continuance, um, so that you don't have to come back in front of us or maybe other things that you want to do. I mean, maybe Mr. Privet's comment of, you know, turn this to, to an SPUD um, and getting all the things that you want to get done wrapped up at one time instead of coming back to us over and over, going to planning commission, et cetera. So I think a continuance is appropriate here. Um, two weeks might be a little bit too short, um, if it's even possible. Yeah, so maybe a month, March 19th. Sounds good. That. Okay. Um, board members, we have a motion 
I'll motion to continue case to March 19th. Second. I have a motion and a second to continue uh, case number 14695 to the March 19th meeting. Cast your votes, please. And it's approved. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Case number two was continued. Case, I'm sorry, item number two was continued. Item number three, case number 14712, request of Trent Construction for a variance to the limitation of a single family structure in the AA Agricultural District located at 5001 Holzman Avenue. Good afternoon. I'm Chad Cargill. I'm the owner of 5001 Holzman, Choctaw, Oklahoma. Um, here for a variance for a remodel of an existing structure. Uh, we purchased a, a home at the end of a dead end road on 20 acres, has an adjacent uh, apartment there by the main home. Our, we had a couple of main purposes for purchasing this. Uh, we have my wife's uh, parents are elderly and uh, gonna need some care. And so we purchased it uh, for them to be able to live in that apartment next to the main house. Uh, and then uh, our secondary purpose long term, we have a bunch of kids. I have eight kids, uh, two biological, we adopted six, two from Congo, three from Uganda, and a frozen embryo adoption. And our youngest from Uganda is special needs and will probably be with us uh, forever. And so uh, yeah, I know, you know, he's gonna need to improve, um, but we are hoping that someday maybe he could live in that and be close and we'd be able to take care of him. So that was our, our goal in, in buying it. Um, we plan to use it strictly for family use and uh, hopefully it will be our forever place. We could not do a lot split because the structures were too close together. So that got uh, eliminated. Uh, we got a building permit to connect the two structures um, with a, a carport and breezeway going between them. Um, we have one electric meter uh, for the two structures we were told um, when we purchased it um, that the original owners had their parents living in the apartment next and so we thought this was going to be the, the right fit and then we applied for the remodel permit and it was denied. Um, we were told it was two structures and therefore we could not uh, move forward. When was this built, do you know? It was 1999 or 2000. Do you have any idea how? Yeah. What? That happened. <coughs> and, I'm just and trying to figure out how this, how it got constructed in the first and place. Why didn't the building permit process trigger the same thing as the remodel permit? Yeah. It, 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 I'm just curious about that. I mean, if you built it and you knowingly built it out of code or something, I think that'd be different. That's not what happened here. Um, I think the AA district helps you in the fact that this is. Um, you know, in the area that it's in, I think tips in your favor. Um, board members, any questions or comments? Do we have a vote? There's a motion, I guess. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second to approve case number 14712 for the reasons that it meets the statutory conditions for a variance. Cast your votes, please. It's approved. Thank you. Item number four, case number 14713, request of Steve Style for a variance to the 15-foot side yard building setback in the RA single family one acre rural residential district located at 7108 Southwest 118th Street. Steve Style, uh, 7108 Southwest 118th. Requesting a variance for a building, <clears throat> excuse me. Just kind of give us an overview of your application. Well, I bought the house in February. Uh, I planned on putting a building, a pool, and a fence in. I went and got permits for all of them. When I started on the building, um, I put 10 foot off the fence line, 25 off the back, or 30 off the back. I was granted a permit for this. Then the homeowners association where I live contacted me, said I'm supposed to be 15 foot off the fence, which I'd already put in footer, inspections, concrete, the building was up, and now I'm at the, here to find out if I can have variance where it's sitting. So are we variant <laughs> our uh, code or the HOA or what? I'm confused. Uh, so it sounds like the, 
All I know is what the city had told me that I had permission, so. Yeah, and they permitted it first. It sounds like just a city mistake. Yes. That's what it seems like, um, where you probably shouldn't have been permitted and they should have told you at the time. Um, I don't see a protest letter from the HOA in here, so they just brought it to your letter to your attention right. that they don't oppose. Okay, and we, we received one support letter um, for this application. Okay, We're, they actually they don't oppose it. it I didn't get a, a letter in protest. Okay, um, it sounds like they just brought it to his attention. But. And my my neighbors didn't have a problem with it or anything like that. Any questions, comments, or a motion? Move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve case number 14713 for the reasons that it meets the statutory conditions for a variance. Cast your votes, please. And it's approved. Thank you. Item number five was continued. Item number six, case number 14616, an appeal of Eric and Nova Flesky of the decision of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, that's located at 439 Northwest 19th Street. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive and 504 Northwest 15th Street, Heritage Hills, Oklahoma City. Um, I am here today on behalf of the, the Fleskies. The Fleskies own the home at the northeast corner of 19th and Walker. Catherine Montgomery is also here. She is the architect that the Fleskies have hired. Uh, we're going to have both of them speak to you today, and then I'm going to uh, also speak on various topics. Before I turn it over, I want to go over briefly the exhibit book that you've got in front of you. Um, a copy has also been provided to Mr. Work, um, what, and it's also within the record. But we wanted to pull out a few of the things that we're going to be talking to just for ease of, of flipping through throughout the presentation. So what you'll see um, on item one is going to be a staff report with Ms. Montgomery's uh, insertions as to her analysis of uh, the guidelines and the code uh, as it relates to this application. Item two, what you'll see on tab two is the, the bottom picture is a current uh, photo of the home. The, the drawing on top is an elevation of what the car cover uh, will look like against the historic home. Uh, three is a series of site plans. You start on one showing you that uh, this is a uh, an, almost an aerial of inside the existing garage. Uh, for reasons that, that we will discuss later, what you'll see that this exhibit is important is because two cars cannot park in there uh, and, and open the doors. So uh, the existing garage had some structural problems that were fixed, which is good. It saved the existing historical garage. However, uh, two cars will no longer fit in there and be able to open their doors. And that's why we're here seeking this accessory structure. Four is a survey that Ms. Montgomery did of a series of unique circumstances that we believe exist on the subject site that warrant the granting of this accessory structure. Uh, five is an aerial showing similar circumstances and conditions to what we're seeking within the a two block radius of the subject site. Uh, and finally, six is the letter uh, from um, Ms. Montgomery explaining why we believe we have a unique set of circumstances. So um, before I, I walk through, I want to remind the board that you know, this is a de novo hearing. Um, what that means is this is a trial anew. You are now in a position to interpret and administer the code and the guidelines as if the HP Commission had never heard this before. Um, we believe at the end of this it will be abundantly clear that the decision of the HP Commission was in error and we will ask you to reverse the decision of the HP Commission and grant the CA that we seek. Um, so with that, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Flesky talk. I'm sorry. Yeah, one, one question for the purposes of the record for you and also Mr. Work. Is there any objection with incorporating into the record the presentations and documents from the proceedings below and also from the prior proceeding before the Board of Adjustment? No, I mean, I don't recall exactly what happened below. I know it was cut off short because it became clear early on in Ms. Montgomery's presentation that we were arguing things that were not evaluated in the staff report because of the email glitch that occurred. Uh, so to the extent that we got along that path, yes. Uh, I will tell you we're, we are taking a different approach than we did last time, so we don't intend to regurgitate everything you would have heard last time. Okay, thank you. But I, I don't have an objection to that.
perhaps Mr. Work does. Yeah, I just I just didn't want for a fact, you know, that maybe wasn't addressed here or something, but just to incorporate what happened before so you don't have to regurgitate every single fact. Well, our understanding is, Mr. Chairman, that the, and my name is Kelly Work, and my address is 105 North Hudson, Suite 304, and I am here representing Historical Preservation, Inc., which is the Homeowners Association uh, for the Heritage Hills neighborhood. And um, if I'm understanding your question, you're asking if the, the things like the record that was before the HP Commission and in the, its previous hearings, whether or not that is going to be admitted as part of this record. If there's any objection with just incorporating that into the record of this proceeding. So even the arguments and presentation um, from the other proceedings, if those are just incorporated into this proceeding. Um, I don't think that we have an objection to that. I do have one qualification. I do have an objection to the exhibit that is exhibit number one that has been provided by the applicant today. and I'm. I'm happy to address that now or at the conclusion of Mr. Box's remarks. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait until, until you speak, but thank you. I'm not <laughs> – so it's not a court of law. I'm not sure what an objection to an exhibit that is a part of the record that staff would have transmitted to you means. Uh, we'll see. But I'll reserve the right, I guess, to rebut whatever Mr. Work comes up with on that in that regard. So um, what you're going to hear is testimony about uh, what, what we are car calling um, a car cover or accessory structure. Uh, for reasons that will become very clear, we believe that staff's analysis is simply misguided and wrong. What you'll see in the staff report from HP is a significant number of pages used to describe landscaping elements, um, gazebos, porticochets, things of that nature, that this is undoubtedly not. Um, this is an accessory structure. What we believe that this case is going to rest on is the location of the structure. We believe that it's clear that an accessory structure is permitted and acceptable pursuant to the guidelines, and what we're really talking about is where should this be located. So the question to ask yourselves is, what is the location to locate this accessory structure that would be the least impactful to the traveling public and the neighborhood as a whole. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, briefly to Mr. Flesky to talk about why he is here in front of the board. So I'm Eric Flesky. I live at the uh, subject address. So why are we here today? Um, I purchased the house in uh, fall of 18. While we had it in our contract, we did discover some additional uh, structural supports within the garage. We found out that the previous owner had almost caved in. And what they did is they put in a series of concrete tilt-up walls on three of the sides over a, th a foot thick, which shrunk the garage down, including structural beams that went across that kept those walls up. So we went ahead and, and closed on the house. And after we closed on the house, we couldn't fit two cars in there. So I went to get help. So I went to find the expert in this area in the historic preservation, Catherine Montgomery, and said, hey, I can't get two cars in here. What options are there? Is, is there an option and what options are there? So we went to explore the different options and found things that would work in the backyard. The problem is, is we have a 100 foot plus tree that would have to be torn down, additional concrete poured, which increases the uh, pervious areas, and landscaping torn out, which is items in which makes the neighborhood beautiful and wonderful and what it is today. So we found a location that we felt like was a balance between being able to keep all of those things, not increase the driveway, or at least very minimalistic increase that driveway, and find a place to somewhat protect a car. Um, and so that's why we're here today. So I'll hand it over to David and Catherine. Yeah, and, and real briefly to further, when, when Mr. Flesky went to Ms. Montgomery, what he advised her, in addition to saying what he wanted, was he said, look, let's let's whatever we end up creating let's make this the standard like if we're going to have accessory structures in this neighborhood knowing that you know heritage hills was likely to protest like they do every single case um let's, let's make this the standard let's make this the thing that people have to do so i don't care what it costs i don't care what it means make it the least impactful make it the standard that we must go by so the next person i want to speak is Catherine montgomery she is the preeminent historical architect in oklahoma city she is the former uh, HP officer for the city of Oklahoma City, and she is the author of the guidelines that you are now sitting 
uh, in equity to hear this case based upon. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Montgomery. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So that I stay on track, I've got some notes. They're very brief. Um, so I'm here not only as the architect of the proposed structure, but also as a subject matter expert. With the past 20 years enmeshed in the historic preservation field as a more than full-time vocation. While development in HP neighborhoods needs to balance the worlds of contemporary living with historic authenticity, so too historic preservation standards and guidelines. To that end, the current HP guidelines represent one of my significant work efforts while I was at the city. Uh, the 2012 rewrite had two specific goals, to update the 2002 standards and guidelines um, and to incorporate what we call green ideas or um, a way to decrease the carbon footprint that many owners were seeking to do. Um, there was rigorous community engagement, and um, which was actually in excess of the norm for Oklahoma City ordinances, including individual meetings with each historic preservation neighborhood review group, uh, meetings with all review groups together, meetings for the community at large, and a one-hour video recording about the new document that ran on Channel 20 for um, a number of weeks. What has been referred to by the HP Commission as a carport, carports didn't come up during that review process, and if they had, they would have likely been given mention in the new standards and guidelines. Um, an important add to the new document were the beginning paragraphs, which I've read before this body and before the HP Commission before. Um, the gist of these um, paragraphs is that 1.1, that change is important to a community's evolution and an indication of healthy neighborhoods. And um, paragraph 1.2, which basically says that HP districts and properties are designated to guide and not prevent change. The HP Commission also has at their disposal the opportunity to consider and render approval of projects based on unique circumstances, which have been established in this case to exist. The proposed design, as you've heard, um, was, best, was the best choice from several alternatives which you've been given um, 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 privy to, to address the need for a car cover to mitigate the inability to utilize the two-car garage to park two vehicles. To be consistent with the spirit and intent of the HP guidelines, in general and for Oklahoma City, the structure is open and of minimal massing, um, achieves the compatibility goal of HP in size and location, minimizing the view from the street face. The materials, features, and finishes are very consistent with the existing house in the neighborhood, making the structure compatible when it might actually be visible or noticed from the street. Along with compatibility also comes differentiation. The structure is not physically attached to any of the existing structures on the property, and while at first take would be seen as compatible, in other words, not taking visual attention away from the existing historic structure, upon closer inspection, the fact that it is not a historic structure would be readily apparent. In addition, we have the unique circumstances of an extreme change in grade between the existing garage and um, the level of the house, combined with a very short driveway that no other property in, the in this neighborhood has. The only other examples in the neighborhood that come close, there were two, and one of them is across the street. It's different from this one, making this one unique, in that this property is definitely has a higher elevation than even that property. So the Commission's concerns about approving the proposed structure that it might set precedence um, could have been assuaged by utilizing these unique circumstances. So after all the careful thought that the owner and the design team put into the project, um, to preserve the maximum of original and historic authenticity at the site by making most of the existing conditions, by making the most of the existing conditions and minimizing any disturbance, to achieve the minimally visible structure that is of a ca compatible and differentiated design, and to mitigate the lack of protected cover for the owner's vehicle. Without equally thoughtful consideration, the best that the Commission could base their decision on was no carports. And that, of course, was at the last meeting um, that we had. So I thank you for your attention and, of course, urge you to approve the proposed structure. And, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments you may have. 
board members, any questions? Thank you. Board, I'd like to start with uh, the guidelines themselves. One of the, the things that makes this, uh, I think, neighborhood unique and, and what allows it to survive is we must have an ability to adapt to modern times. Um, the guidelines were conscious of that and the authors were conscious of that when they drafted the following. The ordinance recognizes that change is important to the community's evolution as an indication of a healthy, vital neighborhoods occupied by residents proud of their neighborhood and its history. Development investment that preserve the historic character of Oklahoma City's historic properties and districts while also enhancing livability are encouraged. Further, historic preservation and historic landmark zone districts are properties are so designed to guide, not to prevent change. I believe the opponents want the guidelines to prevent change. It is clear in reading the guidelines that the purpose of the guidelines is to orchestrate change and to be thoughtful in how we change. One of the key factors in HP decisions is preserving the historic integrity and character of the neighborhood. I believe if you look at the images that we've produced showing what this would look like, that again at tab two, that what you see is minimally invasive. It is designed in a manner to mirror the architectural features of the house, but yet be subservient to the main structure, exactly what the guidelines and ordinances require. I'd like to talk briefly, if you would turn to tab three, uh, about the site plans. Uh, again, what Ms. Montgomery had told you is we do have this unique set of circumstances, even putting the limitations of the garage aside, in that we have this side access, we have a steep incline. Uh, there were only three houses in the entirety of the neighborhood, which encompasses hundreds of homes. Um, and the previous owners did a good thing. They saved the, the structure. The irony in that is they could have perhaps let it fall into such a disrepair that somebody would have been able to seek a demolition of the garage, which are granted more freely than demolition of the main structure, and we wouldn't be here today because the garage would have been rebuilt, perhaps mirroring what it looked like, but in a manner that two cars would have fit. So because somebody did the right thing and, and saved the garage, we have to now find an alternate solution. It is 2020. Most families have two cars, and so having the ability to have both cars protected from the weather the weather we saw this week is an important aspect to increasing the livability of this historic neighborhood. So if you look through tab three as we, we turn the pages, uh, it was suggested early on by staff that we, we look for alternative solutions and we look for a solution perhaps further back, further to the north in the backyard. Um, and so what you'll see as you turn is a series of steps taken by Ms. Montgomery and her design team to see what locating uh, the accessory structure in different places in the yard, as staff suggested, uh, would do and what it would impact. Well, first of all, it would require additional paving, which I believe to be a bad thing. Um, secondly, it would require you to go to an area of the backyard that you're going to run into utilities, which would be a problem. But more fundamentally, what it's going to do is potentially impact that root system for that wonderful old tree. I would submit that if you if you were asked what Heritage Hills is or what Mesta Park is, the first thing that would come to your mind would be the large trees. So pushing that back likely means losing that tree, which I would submit would be more of an impact to the neighborhood than this minimally visible accessory structure. I want to turn briefly to, I assume everybody was provided with a copy of our second notice of appeal. Um, and had the uh, ability to read it. So I want to talk briefly about why we believe that the, the staff analysis was simply in error. If you look at the staff report, the, the staff report dating uh, November 6, 2019, what you'll see is staff spend several pages, beginning at page 3 of 13, talking about section 2.5 of the guidelines, landscape and landscape elements, this is most definitely not that. This is not a pergola. Um, they then talk about porches, canopies, portocochets, and balconies. Again, this is not that. We believe this to be a car cover and an accessory structure. Um, you have to go all the way back to page, I believe, um, 7, where you get to section 4.6 when it's talking about the accessory structure. So what we have laid out in our brief uh, beginning on page six is what is required when you have to comply with these HP standards. So 
Here, under Chapter 59, Section 4250.4 sub D, this is the code. So these aren't guidelines. This is the municipal code directing what the HP Commission and now you, the Board of Adjustment, are to consider when evaluating a certificate of appropriateness. There are seven criteria laid out. I'd like to briefly talk about each of them. So the, cri the first criteria is simply, it's a general statement regarding compliance with the guidelines. Criteria number seven, I'm going to dismiss that because it deals with rehabilitation of buildings, which isn't applicable here. So the rest of the criteria are what I think we need to focus on. So criteria two states, the establishment and purpose of this section, the City of Oklahoma City has previously established the process for granting certificates of appropriateness. It is not the intent to limit new construction to any one period or architectural style, but to preserve the integrity of the historic and architectural resources and to ensure the compatibility of new work constructed in the vicinity. So again, this is another, another reference to we're not here to stop new construction. We're here to make sure that if we have new construction, that it's compatible with not only materials, but architectural style and in keeping with the time period. One of the most important things to that is that new structures or accessory structures aren't the dominant visual element. They're to be subservient, they're to look like they belong, but not look like they overpower. Criteria two, the, the parking structure, in, oh, excuse me, uh, criteria three, the degree to which the proposed work may destroy or alter all or, por or part of the resource. Uh, I don't think we're destroying any of the resource. I think the location selected and the design uh, selected actually does the opposite. I think it preserves resources, it stays out of that tree, um, and doesn't add additional paving. Criteria four, five, and six are kind of lumped together. The degree to which the proposed work would serve to isolate the resource from its historical or architectural surroundings or would introduce visual, audible, vibratory, or polluting elements that are out of character. Criteria five, compatibility of building materials with the aesthetic and structural appearance. Criteria six, compatibility of the proposed design to the significant characteristics of the resource, including a consideration of harmony of materials, details, height, mass, proportion, rhythm, scale, setback, shape, street, accessories, and workmanship. You will not find any reference that I see in the responsive brief filed by my opposition why they don't believe we meet any of the seven criteria. I believe if you read the seven criteria and you look at our application, I think we meet all of them. I think it is clear that this accessory structure is permitted. I think it's clear that the location selected is the least impactful to the neighborhood, the least impactful to the traveling public, and does all of the things that the guidelines seek to do. Finally, if you look again to the staff report from November 6th, the staff talks about the applicant noted the limitations on the usable space in the garage due to the large concrete walls on its interior. And then staff says, staff agrees that the combination of conditions are rare and the applicant has, that the applicant has identified. Staff agrees that the unusual circumstances at the site, similar to the conditions at the property immediately south, may justify an alternative solution for vehicular access and parking at the site. So what we have is where is the most appropriate location. And I would submit if you turn back to tab two and you see that proposed elevation, it's behind an already existing gate. It is much lower than the house. It is architecturally similar to the house, designed with materials that are appropriate pursuant to the guidelines, and designed in a manner to be subservient, but, but match the house. We believe staff was wrong in their analysis. We believe the HP Commission was misguided in their approach. We believe that this is compatible with the code, compatible with the guidelines. We would ask you to reverse the decision of the HP Commission and grant the CA. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Isn't the argument that the code doesn't directly address structures like this? And so HP sort of analogized to pergolas um, and, and other things to guide their decision. Is that sort of, at least from HP's perspective, what HP did? Or I guess we have a fitting. Yeah, I'm Katie Friddle. I'm uh, Planning Department staff, and I'm the Program Planner for Historic Preservation. That's accurate. That's why we included those references to the other guidelines. Most of our guidelines for accessory buildings are clearly written to address things like sheds. Um, and this structure is obviously on a shed in its form and in its design. So we included those references to things like pergolas, trellises, portica shares, 
um, because those were more similar in form to what was proposed. The applicant also um, reference, references Porta Cacheres as kind of a design basis, so we included the guidelines for Porta Cacheres since that was what the design was intended to be based upon. Thank you. And I don't know that it matters what HP did, right? I mean, given that this is trial de novo, but, but yes, perhaps that, that that is what they did. But you are in a position to analyze these independently from what they did. Sure. I, I, similar to HP, I want to understand kind of how, since it's not directly addressed, sure. is it more like an accessory structure, which I think would be your point, or is it not? Is it more like something else? I just kind of like to understand the arguments on both sides. Yeah, so it doesn't touch the structure. Um, I think given the fact that staff was directing us to put it in different locations, tells us it is an accessory structure. And if you look at the guidelines that discuss accessory structures, I, I think we meet it. I think the question becomes for an accessory structure, what is the least impactful? Shoving it to the backyard, I think, has a bigger impact to what this property means for Heritage Hills than putting it anywhere else. Board members, any questions before we hear from the protests? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Work signed up to speak first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. Again, my name is Kelly Work, and I am here representing Historical Preservation, Inc., which operates as the uh, Homeowners Association for the Heritage Hills neighborhood. And, of course, this uh, property at 439 Northwest 19th Street that is the subject of, your, um, of this appeal is uh, within the um, Heritage Hills neighborhood and within the Heritage Hills Historic District. Uh, what I've handed out to you is just a copy of the um, of those criteria that are set out in the ordinance under Chapter 59 for uh, the review by the HP Commission, and of course, uh, of of any certificate of appropriateness that is um, that is filed before it, and of course, uh, is now on appeal here before you as the Board of Adjustment. Uh, any decision by the HP Commission is subject to an appeal uh, to the Board of Adjustment. And so then when the Board considers whether or not a certificate of appropriateness is, uh, is, should be granted, then the Board is to apply the same ordinances, the same criteria that are required to be applied by the, by the HP uh, Commission. Um, Bill Carey, who is president of the Historical Preservation, Inc. at this time, is also present today, and he has a few remarks that he would like to make to you um, shortly. Um, the, um, this application to construct um, a carport and to extend the driveway on the east side of the residence was previously denied by the HP Commission in May of 2019. Uh, we were before you here, as you all uh, will recall, in September, and uh, the decision was made in September by, uh, by you, by the board, to remand the case back to the, uh, to the HP Commission. The applicant had raised an issue about some information that had been submitted to the staff that may have not uh, made it to um, them, to the staff, in time for it to be considered uh, before the completion of the staff report uh, for that uh, HP meeting in May. So the board made the decision to remand the case back to the commission. Uh, then uh, the material, which includes, as I understand it, this uh, survey that Ms. Montgomery has referenced, uh, then that, the, that was further reviewed by the staff between September and November, which is when the HP Commission then heard the case uh, again. 
And what I was referring to, what the, the reference I made to having an objection to the Exhibit 1 in the applicant's exhibit book was that the staff report that they have included in that uh, exhibit is the one from February of 2019. And so I just wanted to point out that, that that is not the staff report that was prepared for the meeting in November of 2019. The one that was prepared in November of 2019 reflects the review that was done by the staff of the survey information that had been submitted by Ms. Montgomery. So I had some concern about that this was the staff report that was being brought to your attention when this was back before in February of 2019. The application was then heard later by the HP Commission. It, the application actually was amended, so it, it does not it's different from the application that was reported on in this February 2019. They, re they had a walkway that was included that was removed. They also made some adjustment to the size of the proposed um, carport building. Uh, so, and then just one other point on that, 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 you know, I also just wanted to address, I, I don't think it's appropriate for for the uh, for this to be an exhibit because they actually have taken the staff report and they've inserted text into this February 6, 2019 staff report and I understand that they've done it in a different color but it is in the same font it actually is blended in with the staff report and my concern I, I just don't think that's appropriate for that to be included as an exhibit to the board because it the, the, the danger of course is that it is going to be interpreted as being a part of the staff report rather than commentary by the applicants representative and so you know, if there's a black and white copy that gets made of this document, it's going to look like all of that text is included as part of the staff report. So I just wanted to, to mention that and bring that to your attention. Yeah. The, the staff report that, that, was, uh, that, that included the staff's comments about the survey that had been submitted, that is the November 6th staff report that... Uh, that was before the HP Commission when they made the decision to deny the application again. Now, Mr. Box, in his comments, made a number of references to that November 6 staff report, but that, that is the report that relates to the application that was decided on November the 6th. Um, yeah, I um, appreciate you pointing that out. I view this, and, and I agree that the, it could cause some complication, particularly for purposes of the record, it's in black and white. This might appear as gray. It's got the comment on the first page that says the comments in green are, you know, from, from the appellant here. Um, but I view this document more as a demonstrative than an actual exhibit, um, as, as kind of a way to summarize their arguments without having to recite them orally at every presentation. So that's how I view this. But I understand your cautioning and bringing all these things to the attention of the board to make sure that it's clear for the purposes of the record. That's the only point I wanted to make. Uh, okay. I don't intend to make a big deal of it, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That raised a concern for us, uh, particularly since a lot of time has passed. The application has changed from what was before the HP Commission back in February of 2019. Several, several iterations of the staff report um, and I understand maybe from the appellant's perspective, modifying in green every time there's a new staff report, you know, I, I understand from their perspective the difficulty there. So, but I appreciate you clarifying that for, for the board. After the board remanded the case back to the HP Commission in September, then uh, the HP Commission staff did review that written survey and the um, map of the garage and driveways for the Heritage Hills neighborhood that was prepared by Ms. Montgomery. And following that review, the staff again recommended a denial of the application, determining that the proposed carport would have an adverse effect on the historic character of the district and the property, 
that it was not consistent with the guidelines and that it was not in compliance with the relevant sections of the municipal code. And in there, they specifically respond to the points that were made in that survey in the staff report on page 13. This is the November 6, 2019 staff report. They do acknowledge that the site has the unusual conditions of a short driveway from the detached garage and a steep grade change from the garage to the dwelling. But they point out that those conditions have previously been addressed by the HP Commission when they allowed the installation of the second driveway from 19th Street. So that was previously addressed. There was an HP Commission decision to allow an additional driveway on the east side of this subject property extending from uh, 19th Street. Uh, the staff went on to point out based on their review of the survey, that the conditions they said are not unique and do not warrant installation of alternative covered parking in the form of an accessory structure or building in an inappropriate location. Uh, they further explained that the other conditions identified, including the side street access to the garage and a garage that is not large enough to accommodate all types of modern vehicles are characteristics that are prevalent throughout the historic districts. So that is a common condition that you have a detached garage that may not be large enough for modern vehicles. And in the staff's view, those conditions do not warrant installation of a carport in an inappropriate location. They further explained that the presence of utility lines, mature trees, or a desire to minimize the presence of concrete may result in the inability to identify an appropriate location for accessory structures, but they do not constitute unique circumstances that justify installation of an accessory structure at, as an, at an inappropriate location. So those were the staff's comments in response to the survey information that was submitted by the applicant after their review between September and the November 6 Planning Commission. They also uh, made the comment pointed out in the staff report that the applicant identified 73 garages with side street access in Heritage Hills alone. So that condition is not an unusual or unique condition uh, in the uh, Heritage Hills area or in the broader uh, historic districts. Uh, this proposed carport structure would be as it is before you today, as I understand it, would be 10 feet 7 inches tall, 15 feet 10 inches wide, and 23 and a half feet long, extending along the east side of the house. It would be plainly visible from Northwest 19th, 19th Street, and it would extend visually from 19th Street from the house to the property line on the east. If permitted, it would significantly alter a side yard setback on the east side of the house from what it is today at 17 feet to zero feet for the entire 23 and a half feet length of the property. The, as I mentioned, the HP Commission previously allowed an accommodation to make this property more livable, which is one of the objectives of the guidelines, uh, by allowing, by approving the installation of the second driveway on the east side of the property. Uh, that was uh, installed again after HP Commission approval. Another example of that type of accommodation is the property that is directly across the street to the south at 436 Northwest 19th Street. That uh, the HP Commission in 2018 allowed a driveway from 19th Street for that residence as well. That is another property which is similarly situated. Uh, it has a, a garage on the side street on Walker. Uh, it has a significant change in the grade and the accommodation that was allowed for that property uh, was to um, 
permit the installation of a driveway from 19th Street at the east side of the residence. When the HB Commission and you all on appeal are um, reviewing whether or not to approve a certificate of appropriateness, the City Council has directed that you all are to apply the uh, guidelines that have uh, been um, referenced and that are um, that were published originally in 2012 and have been most recently amended effective October 22nd, 2019. And what I provided, uh, you all I expect are probably familiar with it, but I just provided with a copy. It's a, it's a you know, at or about 147 pages, uh, but that just is a cover. It actually has been adopted as part of the ordinance in section 4250.4 of chapter 59, and that's what I've made reference to. And then in part B, which is on the second page of that excerpt, the uh, first uh, criteria to be considered uh, when applications for certificate of appropriateness are, bought, are brought before the HP Commission or before the board on appeal from the HP Commission is to follow the criteria that are set out in the preservation guidelines and standards for Oklahoma City historic districts. And so there are, the staff makes reference, of course, in their report to a number of the sections from the guidelines uh, in order to, for you all to consider whether or not it is this particular application for a certificate of appropriateness is, is consistent with what those guidelines um, call for. Um, this proposed carport structure does not comply with those guidelines and is in direct conflict with a number of them. The guideline 2.3 uh, states or requires that you maintain est established side yard setbacks and spacing patterns between buildings to reinforce the sequence of individual structures along the street streetscape. This proposed carport structure most closely resembles a porte cachet under the definition in the guidelines, a porte cachet is defined to be a covered area over a driveway at a side entrance and physically attached to a building. Now, they have chosen in connection with this design to not attach it. They, they don't, they didn't attach it to the uh, structure in their plans. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's still from the, from the view from Northwest 19th Street, it will appear as a uh, porte cachet. Um, the, and the guidelines specifically state at 3.3.38, do not add a porte cachet to a building where none historically existed. 3.3.38 goes on to state, do not create a false historical appearance through the application of new elements and details to a porte cachet. For the purposes of this appeal, the applicant is calling the structure an accessory structure. So they're wanting to stay away from the, uh, from it being characterized as a porte cachet, even though that's what it most closely resembles. But even if you uh, characterize it as an accessory building, it still is in violation of the guidelines. It's not compatible. The guidelines state at 4.5.7 that accessory buildings should be located in the backyards. Accessory buildings are to be minimally visible or not visible from the public right-of-way. The guidelines do not support the addition of, a, of an accessory structure in a visible location where it did not exist historically and is not based on historic patterns of development of the property, the block, or the building. And guideline 4.5.11 states that new accessory buildings shall follow the historic side and backyard setback patterns of other accessory buildings in the block or in the historic district. As mentioned, this proposed uh, structure would eliminate the existing 17-foot side yard setback for the 23-and-a-half-foot length of the structure. There, and the staff points out there are no 
examples of similarly situated accessory buildings either in the block or in the entire Heritage Hills Historic District. The only historic precedent, precedent for any type of building at this proposed location would be a porta cache However, the guidelines specifically provide that a porta cache should not be added where none existed historically. One thing I want to mention is that the, um, the proposed uh, roofing material for the uh, carport structure is a, a TPO, what's called a uh, TPO, uh, it's a rubber roof mem membrane. It is a um, light reflective material that would negatively affect the property next door at 435 Northwest 19th Street, which has second story windows that face west that would overlook uh, that, uh, that roof material. We would request that you affirm the decision of the HP Commission to deny this application. The HP Commission, after the review by the staff and the commission of the survey material, again unanimously denied the application at its hearing in November. It had previously also denied it unanimously at the first hearing in May. The determination was made that the standards and guidelines do not support the addition of a porta cache where none existed historically. The guidelines do not support the addition of an accessory structure in a visible location where it did not exist historically and is not based on historic patterns of development of the property, the block, or the district. They concluded that the historic patterns of development do not support of a of an accessory, excuse me, do not support construction of an accessory structure of any type at this location on the property. Uh, the width of the opening exceeds the width for a typical driveway and is not consistent with pr the proportions of comparable historic uh, structures. To allow um, what is essentially a um, carport to allow new carport structures to be constructed in the historic district with the sole purpose of sheltering cars would establish a harmful precedent. Uh, as has been mentioned and as has been pointed out in the staff report, this situation is not uncommon where th there are detached garages on side streets that are too small to accommodate uh, modern vehicles. And if um, the uh, decision is made to allow uh, car shelters or carport structures in the historic district, uh, there will be many more applications to come. Uh, the decision was made um, when this HP district, uh, when the HP ordinance was established and these various districts uh, were created was to uh, preserve the historic character and not allow new structures that would have an adverse impact on the, on the um, historic neighborhood or the historic district. We um, respectfully request that you uh, uphold the decision of the um, HP Commission and you deny the uh, certificate of, of appropriateness. Uh, you, sh you have letters of opposition that have been submitted from um, William Dykus and Kathy Webster, who live next door to the east of the subject property at 435 Northwest 19th Street. And uh, Mr. Dykus is present today, and I understand he intends to speak as well. And then also there's a letter from Amy Stevens, who owns the home to the north at 438 Northwest 20th Street, and she had expressed also her opposition to the um, certificate of appropriateness. I'll be happy to answer any questions from you, and then I'd like to call on uh, Bill Carey next. Kelly, speak more on the what you're talking about, the rubber, whatever, covering, uh, reflected into the neighbor's yard? Yes, sir. Is that exact? I mean, is that the, the roof, or? It, that would be the roof, yeah. The roof is, a, is to be that uh, thermoplastic olefin material, which is essentially a rubber material that's mo more typically you see on a uh, commercial roof. But because of this, it will be at a level, it's going to be right next adjacent to the 435 Northwest 19th Street property, 
they have west-facing second-story windows, so they're going to be looking out over that uh, light reflective roof now, so it will have a negative impact on their property. I suspect the appellant would be willing to change that if we were to uh, reverse. Um, but still, it's, I think, good to clear up in the record. Um, I think you indicated you were going to call Mr. Carey? Yes. Okay. I'll try to give you a, a respite from the weeds for a minute. I am Bill Carey. I live at 326 Northwest 16th. I'm currently president of HBI, which is the governing board of Heritage Hills. Lived in the neighborhood for 35 years, 40. I can empathize with the, with the flesh keys. Garages, driveways, and parking can be difficult and re require some inconveniences and sacrifices in a historic neighborhood such as Heritage Hills. But the preservation guidelines dealing with such items have been in place for a long time and are essential to preserving the historic fabric of the neighborhood. This proposal to squeeze a carport between two already close houses, and I recommend you look closely at that site plan, um, is not historically appropriate. It's not even aesthetically appropriate. It would be about one foot from the Flusky's house on the west, it would be less than five feet from the neighbors on the east, not five feet from the property line, five feet from the house. Uh, for all practical purposes, it would eliminate virtually all separation between the two houses. Kathy and Bill Dykus, the owners next door, and I think you'll hear from Mr. Dykus, strongly object to it. The, uh, I have talked with them and the neighbors across the street to the south, as well as the neighbor to the north that, that Mr. Work mentioned. They also object to the passage of this. I believe you've received a couple of letters from them. The applicant claims that theirs is a special circumstance because of the nature of their garage on Walker. But I suspect the special circumstance is about additional covered parking. The lack of covered parking and access is a special circumstance that the vast majority of Heritage Hills residents cope with all the time. It is not confined to a handful similar to the applicant's uh, arrangement. There are many properties in the neighborhood that could accommodate a carport and provide additional covered parking. Like Kelly said, you're going to see a lot of this if we, if we, if we allow it to happen. I mentioned the word sacrifice. The property owner does give up some conveniences and freedoms to live in an HP district, but the benefits clearly outweigh those losses. The applicant in this case is asking their neighbor to sacrifice for them by allowing this. The neighbors across the street will be in straight line of sight with the carport. It will be visible from the street as well. It will detract from the fabric of the neighborhood on its own, along with the risk of proliferation of such structures in the future. Everyone else gets to sacrifice with this but the applicant. They have their other design options. Put it further to the backyard, out of sight, and away from the neighbors. Or even, imagine this, correct the existing garage. That's not physically impossible from what I can tell. This proposal came to the HP Commission several times, just wore us out. The staff and commission examined all the details and voted unanimously to deny it, twice. I respectfully ask that you uphold the decision of the HP Commission and the standards and guidelines they work with. It is important to historic preservation. It is very important to Heritage Hills. Please deny this appeal. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Mr. Dykus? Good afternoon. My name is Bill Dykus. I am uh, the homeowner and resident of 435 Northwest 19th Street, uh, the 
home immediately to the east of the uh, property being discussed. Uh, you already have a letter that my wife and I uh, previously submitted, so I'll try not to be too redundant in my remarks, but I did want to let you know that I feel so strongly uh, about this uh, and object uh, strongly to this requested structure uh, that I took time out of my work at the VA to, to be here today. So, um, You received the uh, booklet that was passed out today with a lot of information about uh, the proposal um, and it takes into account a lot of things. One, one thing that it does not mention, I haven't looked through, through it, uh, but I can pretty much guarantee you that it does not mention the adverse impact that it has on the immediate neighbors and uh, we are the most immediate. Um, whether this structure would be physically attached to 439 uh, Northwest 19th, it would in essence be an extension and an expansion of that structure. Um, and as uh, has already been noted, it would bring that structure within about five feet of our house, not of the property line, but of the house. Um, as such, it would dramatically alter our sight lines, our, the light that would uh, be available to, through the windows on the west side of our house. It would uh, impact our uh, view of the natural beauty of the uh, neighborhood uh, that we see out our windows uh, that we specifically chose to move into um, because of the nature of the neighborhood and the respect for uh, the, the natural beauty of the, the neighborhood. Um, and we would essentially be looking out onto, regardless of what surface was used, this is going to be a flat roof um, and it is going to have some level of a uh, corporate look to it. It is not going to be a raked uh, roof that would resemble a, a home. Uh, in addition to that, um, I believe that it would also not only alter the look of our home in addition to the look of their home, <clears throat> but it would, excuse me, <clears throat> um, it would likely affect our property values. There's also concern about drainage off of that additional structure um, and how that would impact our property. Um, especially since it is so close to the foundation of our home, um, as well as uh, the light reflecting, as has been previously mentioned. Um, there's just a number of issues that would compromise uh, our home, both in the quality of our life, but also in potential property values. Um, and the value of our home uh, should we ever decide to, to move from that location. We've been there for over 13 years now, um, and we love it. Um, but we bought the house with the understanding that no one was going to be building anything in between the houses uh, that already existed. We can empathize with the garage situation. Our garage, very similar to theirs, also cannot fit two cars and have the doors open. Um, we have three vehicles in our family because we have teenage children. Um, and we are currently able and always have been 
only able to fit one car in our garage. Um, this is due to the historic nature of the neighborhood, from our understanding, is conversion of carriage houses. Um, and uh, we also, like uh, the Fleskies, make the decision to drive bigger cars. Um, we could choose smaller cars, narrower cars, and potentially fit both cars in our garage, um, similar to them. Um, they knew before they purchased in this historic neighborhood uh, what the rules were about changes. They knew the limitations of their garage um, before they closed on the house, as was disclosed, um, but they made the decision to go ahead and do this anyway. This is, this is a convenience for them. This is not a necessity. Um, the rest of us in the neighborhood uh, have understood and accepted that there are limitations to living in this historic neighborhood. Um, there are trade-offs to our cars set uh, exposed to the weather at all times. Uh, and, and we understand that. Um, we also, I, I also wonder where this would end. If this structure gets approved, then if they decide that they want to add to it, because uh, their children come of driving age, or if they get uh, wave runners or a boat or something that they also want to, to have covered, um, then would they be pushing to, to expand uh, for cover for those additional vehicles as well? Um, and, and as was mentioned before, where would it end for the for the neighborhood? Um, you know, there are plenty of people who have the garages on the side street, um, and those people are are not pushing to to have carports for um, or covered parking uh, for for their properties. Um, you know, they they can make the sacrifice to have it in further back on their property. Um, our, our garage is attached as well, um, so we do make that trek uh, in whatever weather gets thrown at us um, when we're parking in our driveway and in our garage. Um, those are basically the, the points that I would like to make um, to, to let you all know that I have serious objections about this. Um, we like being good neighbors. Um, but we find this to be unacceptable. Thank you. Any questions? Board members, any questions? Thank you. Thanks. I have Ms. Rundell. Some of you know me, I think. Laura does, for sure. But um, anyway, I've lived in Heritage Hills for 43 years. And when I moved to the neighborhood, the ordinance had just been in effect for probably seven years. I chose Heritage Hills because it had an HP ordinance. Because I was living in Dallas a lot, I knew that Swiss Avenue had just been protected in Dallas by an HP ordinance. And for the downtown districts at the time, or the downtown neighborhoods, they were all suffering because people were moving to the suburbs because they weren't being very well taken care of. And so that had a huge impact on me. Uh, about 30 years ago, I became a real estate broker, and I mostly have sold houses in historic districts. I also served on the HP Commission for 12 years, and I helped, actively helped Mesta Park, Jefferson Park, and Paseo become HP districts because they needed the protection of the ordinance, and they still do. And I also, a year or two ago, started an organization called Historic Preservation Alliance. All of eight of the preservation neighborhoods met. And at that time, we were needing more just maintenance code enforcement and that kind of thing. Uh, 
and it was very helpful because we met, we got together, we talked to the city, and some real changes were made that were good for the city and good for the neighborhoods. But because of my real estate broker background, I had many people look at a driveway and go, can I get my Suburban down that driveway? And they would drive down the driveway to see because these neighborhoods all have detached garages, narrow driveways. And I just don't quite understand how this predicament kind of happened because that garage, I believe, was redone about two owners ago and has been used by previous owners. And I am sorry for you if you can't get your car, but you know, there was due diligence on the part of a buyer to, to determine that the property is going to suit their needs. Um, I will say that I'm also on Preservation Review Committee for Heritage Hills. I think our staff at a Historic Preservation Commission does a really good job. And I think that sometimes we disagree, but we have dialogue with you know, the staff, and I think they do make good calls 99% of the time. And so I disagree that they made the wrong call on this. Anybody have any questions about the neighborhood or anything for me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Work, does that conclude your comments? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Box? I want to... I want to start by talking about this this idea that you know these are the rules and somehow the, the Fleskies are coming in here asking to, to violate the rules. To be clear, these are guidelines um, that we're talking about. These are guidelines that are subject to interpretation by staff, HP Commission, and now you. And so it's not some some you know cut and dry. Here are the rules, and we're violating it. These are guidelines. These are guidelines that were drafted by Ms. Montgomery. These are guidelines that the author believes that we fit within. And so when we look at the guidelines that Mr. Work uh, discussed in the accessory structure uh, portion of the staff report, um, 4.5.7, accessory buildings should be located in the backyard, not shall, should. Okay? We believe that we've presented circumstances to show you why we can't put this in the backyard. We think by putting it in the backyard, it's actually a worse scenario for the neighbors, for the traveling public. What we're really talking about, again, is, is this visibly problematic for the neighborhood? I want us all, again, to look at this tab two. When you look at tab two, I believe that when you see what is proposed to be constructed, what is proposed to be constructed is minimally visible, minimally impactful, and fits in not only with the character of the home, but the character of the neighborhood. If you turn to tab five in my handout, you'll see similar situations. What, what these are are por porta caches or accessory structures where they're in very close proximity. When you look at the, Mr. Cunningham, Cunningham, I don't know if you can go to an aerial, but if you look on the screen, there you go, all of these houses are extremely close to each other and the other structures that are on the property next to them. That is one of the characters of this neighborhood. So this is in no way, in my opinion, out of keeping. Like HPI always does is they come up here and they're concerned about the precedent this will set and there's going to be a flood of other applications just like this. That's why Ms. Montgomery went to the link that she did to do this, the survey. And they said 76, it's actually 73. But of the 73, when you dig into the details of those 73, there's only three in the entirety of the neighborhood that share the topography concerns that, are what, that we believe justify the need for this um, Mr. Boss, can you, can you yes, help me flush that point out? Why the topography is so important for the proposed structure? I mean, I'd rather, if you're okay, let Ms. Montgomery do it because okay. she was into the weeds of, of the study. And sort of how that makes, well, I'll, I'll let you elaborate. Thank you. I, I don't know how much of the paperwork that you actually have in front of you, but um, photographs were provided in the staff reports, um, each staff report that was presented, including the one in November. And I would like to call your attention to page 38, which if you can see it from here, this is the situation, the garage. The garage faces the side street, which is happens 76 times out of 400 or so 
properties in Heritage Hills. We're trying to whittle this down, start thinking about, yeah, okay, well, that's not the only one that has a site entrance. Um, it's one of three that has a site entrance that when you're actually putting your car in front of the garage, you're on the sidewalk. So whereas other people, all those other cases, except for those three, can drive all the way across their backyard to get to their garage, which is in the far other corner, and stack up cars in their driveway. That is not the situation here. Secondly, you can see this steep staircase. This staircase is the singular most steep property in the district. On top of that, the garage and this steep staircase are all outside of the fence line. So they're all kind of in the, in the public domain. So not only is this quite some distance to carry your groceries, your kids, your stroller, to hop up when you broke your leg falling down you know, six weeks ago, um, it, it's, it's a treacherous condition. And the, I think in lieu of that, the driveway was granted in 1985. Subsequent to 1980, after 1985, the garage was repaired, which made it smaller on the interior than it had been before, where it can only park one car now. And the proposed structure sits on top of the existing driveway width. So the structure is no wider than the, than the driveway that was created in 1985. The driveway does extend a few feet into the backyard so that we could get the structure back as far as possible. So that's the treacherous condition. It only occurs one time in this specific topography in this neighborhood. So again, what I started with, I, I think the, the question for you really is, is this visibly impactful and problematic for the neighborhood? Because these are guidelines. These are guidelines that are, for lack of a better term, squishy. I mean, they are subject to interpretation. They use words like shall and strive for and things like that. They aren't hard and fast where you can know exactly how to meet the guidelines. And I'm going to close with one of the, the, the goals and, and things that the guidelines intended to do when Ms. Montgomery drafted it, and that is guide, not prevent, change. So with that in mind, I believe that we have demonstrated a uniqueness that exists on this site, the need for this, and that therefore we ask you to reverse the decision of the HP Commission and grant this CA. Thank you very much for your consideration. Board members, any questions? Okay. Thank you. I'll sort of get my comments out there. If I could summarize the appeal and the proceedings at, in front of HP, it seems like if it's not a, well, let's, let's assume that it's a portico share, HP would say that's not appropriate. Let's assume that it's a pergola, HP would say that's not appropriate. Um, let's assume that it's an accessory structure, HP would say that's not appropriate. I think it's not clearly defined what this is, but the appellant's argument would be, it's not any of those things, or if anything, it's an accessory structure, but it's not technically an accessory structure, at least within the intent of um, the guidelines and the code. Therefore, it's appropriate. I mean, to me, it just doesn't really follow that it doesn't, if it were anything that is existing under the guidelines and under the code, it's not appropriate, but it's not, and therefore, this is appropriate. I mean, that just doesn't follow to me. Um, I had concerns about the specific findings by HP um, for purposes of appeal, particularly what we call this thing and the, the guidelines that we judge this against, for example, portico share, pergola. If it's not a portico share, why are we, you know, saying that it doesn't fit within the guidelines? Um, but notwithstanding those concerns, I, I don't know that I would even take away from any of the specific findings from HP given that this structure is not clearly defined. Um, and I, I support HP's conclusions. Um, it's a tough case and there are difficult issues and it doesn't fit squarely within the guidelines or the code. 
but I still support HP's conclusions, notwithstanding my concerns about some of the specific findings. So that's kind of where I am right now. Any other comments? I do have a comment, and it's, it's a very tough decision to make. However, there were some points brought up. For instance, um, you, you yourself stated that you purchased the house in 2018. The revisions to um, their document was after the time that the second revisions was in 2019. So my question is, were you at the meeting when they made that decision, knowing that you could have said something at that time that we're planning on doing that. And also, um, as a homeowner, as the lady stated, you know, those, the garage was already there. You knew what your needs were. And, you know, it seems as though it was an oversight maybe on your behalf. But it's very tough, a very tough decision for me. But those are some things that stood out while listening at both sides. Can I ask a quick, when you're referring to 2019, what are you referring to? 2019, when this um, revision was made. Revision to the guidelines? Mm hmm So our application, it, it doesn't fall with, our application was submitted prior to that October 2019 revision, so it wouldn't fall under that. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. But prior to um, that date, when it was adopted in 2012, did you read any of these things? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's why, again, I, it's a difference of opinion. Because not only did he read it, he hired the woman that drafted the guidelines. But he hired the author of the guidelines. So it's a difference of opinion as to whether or not this complies with the guidelines or not. We believe it does. The author believe it, believes it does. And HP in the neighborhood doesn't. So, yeah, I mean, he, he was aware of them. But again, they're, they're guidelines, not municipal code, and they're subject to interpretation. And, and that's basically what it is. It's an interpretation sure. of what we perceive that we're getting out of it. So thank you very much. Right. Do you have any comments, or was that, did that clarify what you were going to say? Yeah, I was just going to say the revision in 2019, I think, was one very small insertion dealing with um, small cell antennas, so it wouldn't have come across their radar, most likely. No pun intended with the radar comment. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point, I, it's well taken. I mean, if you're going to move into HP, you've got to know that you're going to be dealing with some things like this. Um, and if you're going to change them, it, it's potentially going to be an uphill battle. Um, although it is a matter of interpretation. Having the, the drafter here is compelling, um, but even with all that, I, I can't say that HP necessarily got it wrong. And even under a de novo review, I think that I come to the same conclusion. We submit about 12 to 20 applications before HP each year with my company. We've been in business 10 years. Prior to that, um, you know, as Katie knows, you can review about 200 cases a year in that position, so I reviewed about 600 cases in the three years that I was there. Um, all of those people that are coming forward are coming forward to make some kind of a change to a property that they've either just purchased or maybe they've owned for a long time. And those changes can include um, two-story additions to the back of the house that are maybe nearly the same size as the original structure. So they can um, be quite large and quite visible. Um, so, you know, changes happen whether you purchase the property intending to make a change or if it was something that you thought about later. Um, the side setbacks in historic neighborhoods are generally um, about three feet. Uh, there are structures that are located closer than that to the property lines. And if you happen to tear down your garage and put it back on the same footprint and it's within one foot, then you're allowed to do it. In this particular case, um, the properties might be very close, but that's because the neighborhood, pro the neighbor property is very close to their property line. And the proposed structure is well within their property 
and it's well within the setbacks that are commonly found in the historic districts. So those are two of the points that I thought would be speaking directly to um, some of your concerns. Members, any comments? I just have one more question. You're proposing a two-car um, car part, or whatever you're calling it. Fancy. Single car. Fancy car. Oh, one. Fancy. It's a single it's car. Single? Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, I just have to agree with HP when they say here on specific finding, particularly number four here, they essentially say, whatever you're going to call this, it doesn't fit the historic patterns of the development um, in the area and for this property. Um, and they don't support a structure like this of any type. So whatever you're going to call it, they don't support it. Um, I think there's kind of a false dichotomy being asserted in that this can't, it either has to go where it is or where the proposed location is or in the backyard, and it can't go in the backyard for the reasons that have been stated. It's kind of a false dichotomy. I mean, the alternative is it just doesn't get built. I mean, it doesn't, it's not a matter of right that you, that you get one of these structures. Um, so that's kind of where I come out. I've been outvoted before, but that's kind of where I stand. If we have any other comments or a motion? I, sorry, I have one question. Um, Mr. Box, the um, opposing side brought up the issue of the garage, the existing garage actually being um, modified. I know you guys mentioned there was two, two foot um, concrete walls on either side of it. To, is there any option of yeah, I, I'm doing something to that existing building sure. where it would fit the cars? I don't think so without losing the structure, right? That, to, and to me, that, that's the great irony here. Um, I don't believe that Mr. Carey or Mr. Work are engineers of the structural variety, but sometimes you can't. Uh, my next door neighbor on 15th Street, we actually had to go and get approval to demolish his garage because you couldn't save the garage without losing the entirety of the fabric of the historic structure. And so I think that is what we have here. To try to, to fix it, to make it work, you essentially lose the historic structure and the fabric that, that makes it historic. So that, that's the problem we face, is the, the good decision to um, keep that structure means that it, it's kept in a manner that won't allow you know, what, what modern cars have. So, it, it becomes a problem. One more thing to add to that is when they mention that there's only three houses similar at scenario, the actual garage is completely below grade. The backyard sits one foot above the garage. Actually, I had to install a French drain system just this last spring because water from the backyard goes down the garage wall and comes through it. And when I'd raise the garage door, I had a dam and water come out. So I diverted the water around the structure instead of coming through it just this last spring. So one of the reasons you can't expand it is, is it's nine feet underground from the backside of the, the garage, the entire back half. Well, if we have a motion, I think there's some proposed language circulating whether to affirm or reverse or modify or whatever the board would like to do, but we do need to get a motion. I'll make a motion that we affirm the decision of the Historic Preservation Committee and um, deny HPCA 18-00205. We get some, specific, some more yeah. specifics. Thank you. My motion would be for the specific reason that it does not comport with the, the guidelines and standards that we've been discussing. Do you want to incorporate the um, conclusion by HP Commission and uh, specific findings of HP Commission or not? You can selectively do that or you can do all of them. Well, I've had an opportunity to review all of them, and I guess, I mean, I, being that I agree with them, I would incorporate the specific findings of um, fact one through seven. Second. A motion and a second to affirm. 
uh, appeal in case number 14616 for the reasons stated in the motion. Cast your votes, please. And it's affirmed. Case number seven has been withdrawn. Case number eight has been continued. Any other additional items? Seeing none, communications or board reports that I'm aware of, citizens to be heard or other business, we're adjourned.